So my name is Kago Müller. I work at DRW in Berlin, and I present a paper that is uh, based on joint work with uh, Victor Steiner from the Free University in Berlin. So what I'm going to do now is uh, um, uh, giving you a specific example of, of a or kind of a um, case study for one country that is Germany, and I try to go a little bit beyond uh, the general notion of the inefficiency or ineffectiveness, as you like it, um, of a minimum wage as a redistributive tool, addressing some of the mechanisms behind that finding, right? So we had, so far we had this distribution of minimum wage earners across the income distribution, but there are all other factors uh, influencing this inefficiency. That is, uh, interactions with the tax and transfer system and also uh, the uh, potential behavioral adjustments behind this or after the introduction of a minimum wage, not only in terms of the aggregate effects, thinking in terms of uh, labor demand or um, also um, consumption behavior and price increases, but particularly uh, on the distribution of those effects among different people, right? These are, as the, as the wage effects, uh, employment effects are not uniformly distributed, but uh, are concentrated on those people who benefit, uh, potentially benefit most from a minimum wage. So I try to be a little bit more specific than so, so far maybe in this conference about those uh, mechanisms. So um, regarding the background and the motivation uh, of this talk and also of the whole minimum wage discussion in Germany, um, uh, we have he heard this on a more general and more comparative level in more detail in this conference uh, several times. So also in Germany that we have the problem of a rising wage and income inequality. We have, so, so on these two margins, uh, speaking of uh, labor earnings, an increasing low wage sector and the polarization of wage incomes on the one hand and also this also translates and is related to growing income inequality. And uh, there was a big debate one or two years ago about the erosion of the middle class in Germany. So. Um, I could show you figures, but I will spare uh, the time uh, for, for, for other points. So this is the background of this uh, minimum wage discussion in Germany, as you have seen, for, for example, in Herrick's presentation, is, uh, has long been in the minority of OECD countries without a minimum wage. So finally, after a long debate, uh, the German government decided to in introduce a federal minimum wage, and it will come into effect in 2015. Uh, and with some exceptions and in full, this will be uh, in full effect uh, in 2017 without uh, any of those um, uh, transitional exemptions. So um, related to those different trends in inequality, there are different motivations behind the minimum wage that were brought forward uh, in this debate. The one is uh, related to this erosion of wage bargaining institution and downward wage pressure you would have some kind of um, um, relatively moderate minimum wage level as a ba basic threshold um, to prevent excessively uh, downward wage pressure. And you could, in, in this, in this um, um, line of argument, you could think of the, the uh, combination, as just talked about, a combination of a lower wage floor and uh, some wage subsidies to prevent negative effects on employment. So this is one line of debate. The second one was, uh, uh, and this is uh, this social policy perspective that uh, a minimum wage might um, prevent inward poverty and will reduce income inequality. And this was a big topic and it still is among uh, the major German parties. Um, so a minimum wage will affect the, uh, the um, uh, income distribution and reduce income inequality and prevent uh, particularly inward poverty. And the third, factor uh, that uh, was important for the minimum wage, that uh, this, this uh, kind of campaign for a federal minimum wage really uh, gained steam in the 2000s. It began with a few advocates at the, uh, the end of the 90s, and by the end of the two, uh, or, or by, let's say, uh, the, the last elections after 2000, uh, in 2013, the majority of the German public was in favor of a minimum wage. It was huge, even for those parties, the conservative CDU, that uh, for a long time opposed the minimum wage, about two-thirds of their electorate was in favor of the minimum wage. And finally, in the great uh, grand coalition that is, uh, came into office after 2013, they agreed on uh, the introduction of a federal minimum wage in the amount of uh, 8 euro 50. So, so this is uh, um, uh, the background in Germany. What uh, as I indicate, what I will do, or what we did in this paper is, um, we want to uh, answer the question how this federal minimum wage, which has not been, uh, 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 is not uh, into effect in Germany so far, 
um, will affect the wage distribution and more importantly the uh, distribution of disposable net incomes in Germany. And does it reduce income inequality? We had an earlier paper that was more focusing on poverty. Um, I will um, touch on it here and there, but this is more of the, the general um, income inequality in Germany. So the contribution uh, of this paper is, um, oh, that you can think of several contributions. First is um, to incorporate in, in this distribution analysis, as I said, uh, several margins of behavioral adjustments, labor supply, labor demand, and also uh, increase in product prices, and which, which affects consumption. The second one is, and this is very important, and maybe should be more uh, be more ex uh, made uh, more explicit uh, in in our general discussion. It, it, there's clearly an interaction with the existing tax benefit system of a minimum wage, particularly in a comprehensive welfare state as Germany is. So you will see that in the results, uh, which is my third point. And another one is we in this in this uh, version of the paper we uh, systematically compare different levels of the minimum wage. So it's, it's really crucial where you set it in terms of employment effects, but potentially, and you, you'll see this is uh, kind of the question of this paper, how far this influences the efficiency or effectiveness of, uh, as a redistributive tool. So we systematically compare a, a rather low level of five euros per hour with uh, the level they decided about eight euro 50, which is in the European comparative perspective still a rather high level and, a, and, a, and the higher level that the left, left party, for example, in Germany um, advocates of 10 euro per hour. Okay. So this is what I'm going to do. I very briefly um, give you a review of the literature and then talk a little bit in a hopefully rather non-technical way, uh, way about the methodology behind this, briefly about the data and then uh, discuss uh, the results and conclude. So uh, theory is not the right word for this. This is just um, kind of uh, to give you an idea what the transmission mechanism behind a minimum wage uh, could be in an, in an uh, 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 Western economy and, and to which, which parts of this me mechanism we try to um, uh, to simulate in, in, in our study. So first point is pretty clear. There's a nominal direct effect on, on the wage distribution for those who are covered uh, and uh, fall under the minimum wage. So uh, their, their wages, uh, if uh, we assume full compliance, their wages are affected to the level of the minimum wage. And uh, then the question is, um, Okay, I, I will come back to this later, how far a lot, uh, higher parts of the wage uh, distributions will be affected. So there's a nominal effect on the wage and uh, income distribution. And then this is the second point, uh, potential indirect effects, uh, effects through spillovers. So setting a minimum wage, which certainly not only affect those who are nominally uh, fall under the minimum wage, but kind of shifts potentially the whole wage distribution. This is not part of, of this simulation study because we didn't want to make any assumptions about the degree and uh, of this uh, uh, spillover effects. Then after this uh, income increase, uh, uh, this is, which is induced by the, by the setting of the minimum wage, uh, obviously several behavioral adjustments will occur. Labor supply will adjust since uh, a minimum wage will affect labor supply incentives through um, potential, potential earn, income to be earned. And on the other side, the labor cost side, uh, demand will adjust. So what we're thinking in a kind of a general, uh, or in a, at least a labor market equilibrium uh, um, uh, way about this is then after, after demand and supply adjust, there will be a n new equilibrium uh, wage level and new employment levels. We try to, um, we try to um, uh, reflect at least partially this, this type of mechanism. We look separately in this paper, separately at labor supply and demand with um, estimated elasticities. What we do not have in here is this equilibrium effect. So this adjustment mechanism after supply and demand uh, adjusts to a new uh, wage level. This is out, out, outside the scope of this paper. Then fourth point here, um, firms adjust not only in terms of their labor force, but also uh, regarding their input-output mix and their product prices. And we try to uh, um, uh, to simulate some of this uh, adjustment mechanism, at least in translating um, uh, changes in labor costs into product prices. I will come back to this point. Fifth point here, adaption of consumers' command. So their income changes, product prices change, uh, consumption uh, behavior will change in terms of aggregate consumption, also the um, the uh, pattern of consumption, obviously. In another ver version of the paper, we have some kind of um, um, 
um, consumption module. In, in this version, I won't talk about uh, a consumption, only about uh, the price changes. And then the final point, this is the, the, the really general equilibrium point, is that all of those changes lead somewhere to a new equilibrium. And this, again, is outside of the scope uh, of this paper. Okay. So um, concerning the literature, we have much heard about the, how do you call it, obsession with employment. And this is, uh, I would share this, I would share this uh, observation. Um, still, it's, it's, it's the main focus of the empirical literature and it's so much fun uh, debating this. I have, a, after, after reading maybe too many of those studies, um, I, I have a, a little nuanced view on this, how, how you interpret, interpret uh, the findings in the literature, because you can explain the huge range in, this, in these findings. And it's not, and I would say it's not that um, the majority of studies does not find anything or is inconclusive, you have, to, you, have to, uh, you have to look at the specific situation because the variation in terms of, so in technical terms, in terms of identification, how, how this is estimated, is, there's a huge range and, and more importantly and more substantially, um, there is a huge variation in institutional settings and minimum wage levels and induced changes in minimum wages. So you, you would expect uh, a very uh, so so kind of a distribution of results, and it's not it's not um, that surprising. So I would always always suggest, and this came up in in, in private discussion in some of the presentations, you, you have to look at a specific situation in a country, at the minimum wage level, at the institution, and so on, and to get a better feel. And uh, international comparisons help, but they they won't won't help that much, I would say. So. Too much said about employment. The second strand of studies, uh, wage inequality. So these studies look at uh, how effects, uh, how the uh, minimum wage affects the wage distribution uh, on average, and particularly how, um, if and to, to what degree, higher higher um, quantiles of the wage distribution that are not formally under a minimum wage will be affected by the minimum wage. What it's, what, what, what's more relevant for, for, for my talk is now the third um, 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 group of studies this, uh, that is uh, clearly in the mi minority still, looking at the redistributive effects of a minimum wage and on uh, its effects on inequality. There are some early studies and uh, there are some uh, uh, there, is a, there are chapters or sections in, in the uh, very popular reviews about this and over the last maybe three, four, five years, um, this, is, uh, um, this, this um, field has, has um, gotten more attention. Uh, so you have basically two types of um, methodologies in this field. You have simulation studies. This is where, where we are because we cannot ex post evaluate uh, a minimum wage in Germany. There hasn't been one. Um, so I have a number of studies here. And then you have a second strand and this is, uh, this is a growing, um, strand of literature, you have, similar to the uh, employment effects, you, you try to estimate ex post uh, the effects on the income distribution. And uh, as in the, as in the uh, employment literature, uh, the more studies you get, the more heterogeneity in the results you get. And the, the early consensus that it was completely ineffective as a redistributive tool has kind of um, um, switched a little bit to a more, <laughs> into the direction of the employment debate that people are, uh, um, are, are arguing about. How ineffective is it or is it not? And I would again say, look at a specific country and uh, it really depends on, the, on many factors. I will come back uh, to this point. So th this is a kind of an uh, overview over the literature and, and our study falls in, in this category of simulation studies of the uh, income effects. So what do we do here, methodology? So at first uh, we simulate uh, wage effects in a very straightforward and um, 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 intuitive manner, we compare the observed wage distribution uh, with microdata, with uh, hypothetical wage distribution, setting all these wages below the, the minimum wage uh, level to the minimum wage. So we assume full coverage and full compliance in this case, and also no spillover effects or effects on, uh, on higher parts of the wage. Uh, distribution. We do that, as I said, for three different levels. So we have the observed wage distribution and uh, three um, um, uh, three simulation scenarios with, with different levels. This is the definition of uh, our hourly wage measure, and we have um, a robustness analysis for different uh, uh, problems. It's obviously and it also 
also came up in the discussion this is an obvious problem to really um, measure hourly wages depending on the data set you have different problems uh, uh, of measurement error okay we use um, German household data from the ZERP uh, I think for this study from the year 2010 or 2011 and forward project them uh, to 2013 so all figures I present for Germany are for the reference year of 2013 Okay, so first step is a simulation of wage effects. Then in a second step, we simulate the income effects. How do we do that? We have a comprehensive um, a micro simulation model for, for uh, all German households. So for each individual household, based on uh, its composition and the number of wage earners and other income uh, and uh, uh, characteristics that affect um, taxes and transfer, we calculate from this nominal um, uh, gain in uh, wage incomes, we, get, we, we, we uh, simulate that is a change in disposable household incomes. What does is, um, so we, within this uh, um, micro simulation, uh, these are the different um, sources of gross earnings. Besides earnings from dependent employment, we have different sources of other incomes. It uh, includes income tax, social security contributions, a whole range of social transfers. And the important point is it, it kind of um, reflects um, important non-linearities and interaction between those different, um, um, uh, those different measures uh, with the minimum wage. For example, means-tested income support schemes. If you increase labor income for, for an earner in the household, uh, this might substitute um, uh, means-tested um, uh, transfer income also exemptions from social security contributions and very important for Germany because minimum wage earners in couple households tend to be secondary earners with low hours uh, it's very and, and this affects then since those households have uh, uh, joint or are, uh, are taxed jointly this affects the marginal tax rate for the whole household if the uh, uh, labor in income from the secondary earner goes up okay so First step, wage uh, simulation. Second step, simulation of incomes. And then we have a um, different behavioral adjustment. As I said, the most straightforward is, um, is um, labor supply of those households. This is pretty standard, so I won't talk uh, long about this. We have a household labor supply model. Uh, assume that uh, households jointly maximize their income. Uh, and uh, their utility also depends, obviously, on the amount of work or, or leisure, if you, uh, if you like. And, this uh, labor supply model takes all these uh, um, things about uh, the tax and transfer system into account. And we have a discrete choice model, pretty standard in the literature. It allows for uh, amount of, uh, or for different channels of heterogeneity based on observed and unobserved variables. Okay, so we translate those income changes into uh, behavioral changes in terms of labor supply first. Then we have um, a labor demand part. This is so so far you can so so far this is a micro model we we calculate wage effects income effects and um um and uh, labor supply effects on the individual or respectively household level for labor demand we cannot do this we have some uh type of heterogene heterogeneity in here so what we do is we calculate labor cost increases following the the uh increases in the minimum or the uh increase in wages and uh, through the, um uh, as a as a um due to a minimum wage. And then we uh, use estimated labor demand elasticities that were estimated on a different data set. And those labor demand elasticities uh, um, allow for some heterogeneity between different um, uh, labor categories. Um, for example, they are, um, uh, we have differences in terms of uh, region, gender, qualification level, and type of contract. So full-time, part-time, and marginal employment. So we have differential wage changes and we have um, substitution and uh, substitution effects between those types of labors. So what, what happens then in this demand model given wages, etc. So we have a direct demand effect, the relative price of labor changes uh, uh, compared to other um, uh, factors of production. Then there's indirect effect because the relative prices of labor between different groups change. This is also in there. And Obviously, there will be some kind of aggregate demand uh, effect because as, as uh, uh, labor costs increases, um, uh, product prices react, aggregate demand will react. 
we don't have empirical estimates on this. So therefore, we have a range of aggregate demand elasticities that we, that we use and show you the range of the results for these different um, demand elasticities. So this is labor demand. And finally, as I, as I indicated, we also have calculated the consequences for, for prices. So besides em uh, uh, employment and alternative margins of adjustments for, for firms is obviously to adjust uh, prices. Uh, again, we translate um, the uh, increase in uh, wages and labor costs through input-output matrices to uh, price changes in uh, different um, categories of goods. Um, with really uh, um, very strict assumptions, so we assume perfect competition and a perfect, uh, perfectly elastic supply of goods, uh, which means that all the, of those cost increases can be shifted to consumers. In reality, that won't be the case, but um, since we don't have an estimate, uh, uh, we just uh, have to assume this for, for, for simplification. So this is the last um, uh, margin of behavior adjustments we, we, we look at. Okay, and as I said, what we then try to do is incorporate those different behavioral adjustments besides any nominal increases in wages and incomes into this um, distribution analysis and look again at um, disposable incomes after uh, those different channels uh, of adjustments. Yeah, there are several limits or limitations to, to our approach. We have rather strict assumptions for, for the obvious reason. And as I said, we have no general equilibrium effect. So the different channels do not interact in our model. And also what we don't do here is we don't have uh, third round effects. So assume that um, a minimum wage leads to, uh, or, or so, so gains, fiscal gains from the minimum wage, if there are any, are not redistributed because we don't want to have, uh, make assumptions on the re uh, redistribution mechanism at this point. So this is um, kind of an outline of the limits of, uh, there are more in detail, but uh, these are the most important. We use different data sets for this uh, exercise. The most important one is, as I said, the German household panel, uh, social economic panel. Um, then we have, uh, for the demand estimation, we use administrative data, uh, the, the employment panel from the uh, statistical agency of the uh, labor office, and we use uh, f um, this, these are data for uh, um, consumption prices and uh, consumption behavior. Okay, let's let's go to the results. Um, maybe the figures are not perfectly readable, but I will I will I will talk about the most important things. So um, three different columns here for these three different wage levels we look at: minimum wage of five, eight euro fifty, and ten euros. Let's first look at the aggregate effect on the wage sum. So a rather low minimum wage level uh, of five euro per hour will increase uh, wages in Germany in 2000, or would, would have increased wages in 2013 in Germany of about one billion euros per year, or less than zero point, uh, or about 0.1 percent of the wage uh, of the of the uh, uh, wage total wage sum. sum. So this is so a low minimum wage would really have a marginal effect, uh, aggregate effect on on wages. If you look at uh, eight euro fifty, it's it's considerably higher, about uh, uh, thirteen billion per year. And uh, but still, in terms of the overall wage sum, this is still a rather yeah, it's it's a moderate effect in terms of the overall wage sum. It's uh, one point two percent of the overall wage sum. So it's more of a, it's more of a problem in the, in the lower part. The, so the aggregate effect is still, you could say, it's still moderate. And uh, um, setting it at 10 euros uh, doubles this amount to about 26 billion per year, and uh, um, likewise to then uh, uh, almost 2.5 uh, percent of the uh, overall wage sum. So this is just the aggregate effect. We are m much more interested in, in uh, measures of inequality. And I've, in this table, I have two uh, measures. So the first is uh, looking more at the bottom of the wage distribution, a simple measure of the 10th and 50th uh, percentile of the wage distribution. Uh, in this panel, uh, for the status quo without the minimum wage. And then here we have the changes uh, for these different uh, minimum wage levels. And what we can see is first that um, a minimum wage of five euros, so a very low level of minimum wage, uh, won't change much uh, in terms of the wage distribution. Um, 
it, at the bottom and also in, in overall wage inequality. It's, it's very different if you look at uh, the uh, level of 8 euro 50, you see an, a, sign a significant increase in the, in the 10 to 50 percent uh, percentile ratio, which is statistically significant, and also in the overall uh, uh, wage inequality as measured by the Gini coefficient, right? So you get a significant increase and a substantial impact on the wage distribution um, uh, uh, by minimum wage of eight euro fifty, and this is uh, even higher and uh, even more clear uh, if you if you if, if the minimum had been uh, would have been set by uh, at ten euros per hour. Okay, so the first finding is. Based on all the assumptions of full compliance and full coverage, we have a significant uh, impact on the wage distribution by a minimum wage of eight euro fifty. Um, besides uh, overall inequality, it's clearly um, uh, there's heterogeneity in, in the minimum uh, in the effect uh, of ra uh, on wages, and these are the usual and well-known facts about how these. Um, uh, wage changes would be distributed uh, across different groups. For Germany, you have clearly um, a uh, much higher impact in East Germany compared to the West, and also for women compared for women compared to men, in terms of uh, the number of affected and also the relative increase in wages. So, uh, region and gender, you have the very obvious um, pattern uh, uh, um, regarding age groups. So, the youngest age group. Uh, according to this classification, is clearly uh, by far the mostly affected group of all uh, people. In term, uh, uh, the relative increases in wages are not as uh, different as, uh, for example, by region. You also see a, uh, the expected pattern for the level of qualification. You see the pattern in terms of a type of uh, contract. So full-time employed would be much less uh, affected than uh, marginally employed. So in our sample, about half of the marginally uh, employed people, people working in many jobs, would be affected by minimum wage. Uh, also, I have to say this is all, all for the level of eight euro fifty. And uh, last, last uh, well-known finding is that it, um, crucially depends on the firm size. You see kind of a monotistic relationship with the increasing firm size. They are less and less uh, affected by the minimum wage, and we also have the same pattern for the relative increase in minimum wages that would be necessary for those firms. So we can reproduce uh, these well-known uh, findings in terms of heterogeneity for groups. Um, very uh, briefly uh, to the labor supply margin, the overall finding is that, and this already kind of um, uh, precludes the findings on, on the disposable incomes, that uh, effects are very moderate on labor supply, which has to do with uh, this, uh, these different mechanisms on earnings. So um, they, as, as the, I will show in a minute, the, the nominal increases in wages do not translate into high increases into disposable incomes. And since we uh, base our labor supply model on the change in disposable incomes, this is what, what is relevant for, for households, um, the effects are rather mo moderate. Um, so a minimum wage of five euro would basically hardly change any, anything in terms of labor supply. Uh, um, a minimum wage of eight euro fifty would uh, we would estimate an increase in labor supply. And remember, this is only labor supply; it's just kind of a change in incentives and how people would react, not in realized employment, um, uh, of fifty to sixty so, so, uh, thousand people overall. And again, we have heterogeneity in terms of groups. So um, uh, women are much more affected than men, and uh, people in East Germany, again, uh, are strongly affected than in West Germany. And if you, if, if, if you would choose a higher minimum wage level of around 10 euros, these numbers are more than doubled. So incentives are clearly depend on uh, the level the minimum wage is set, again. Okay, but the overall message is that um, um, so that the overall impact on supply is rather moderate. Coming to labor demand, so so remember we have um, different simulation scenarios. Um, so again, three different minimum wage levels, and we have three columns, and uh, these three columns um, refer to this. Um, aggregate um, uh, elasticity of consumer demand, so a perfectly inelastic, um, a, a medium range of elasticity and a high range of uh, very elastic um, uh, consumer demand. 
and what you can see here is uh, in different rows the heterogeneity in terms of different um, types of labor, so men and women and skill level. And we also have estimates, separate, separate estimates for East and West Germany I, I haven't shown uh, or haven't put it uh, in, the, in the presentation. So again, you see uh, in, in terms of overall effects, um, uh, regardless of the uh, consumer demand uh, estimated or the estimated um, um, labor demand effects are very moderate for the very low level of, of minimum wage of five euro. This changes drastically if you compare it to a level of eight euro fifty. And again, um, I, I don't want to say what the correct um, aggregate elasticity would be. It's, it's, it's more, much more interesting to look at the pattern of results in terms of this type of elasticities and how they affect the overall, the overall uh, uh, estimate. And a quick look at 10 euros shows that, again, it more, it more than doubles. So um, uh, if you, whatever you assume here, uh, it's, clearly, it's clearly important where the minimum wage is set in terms of um, uh, um, plausible estimates you get uh, or different estimates you get uh, for, for labor demand. What, so so uh, things I, I'd like to get across is that it really depends on, on the aggregate consumer demand, which we hardly can anticipate. And w w which is even more important is, again, uh, those patterns in terms of different types of labor. Um, uh, as you can see, marginally employed uh, are uh, very much affected by this. Um, so I haven't, haven't put the, the stock of employment in here but, and, and no percentage changes, unfortunately. But it's, it's, in terms of percentages, it's, it's much higher than for, uh, compared to full-time employed. Since the stock is very high, the, the absolute number is, is comparable. But in, uh, in relative terms, uh, marginally employed are clearly mostly affected, uh, would be mostly affected uh, according to our estimates. The same is uh, with different skill levels. And again, uh, women are more strongly affected than men. So now uh, let's look at the um, effects on the disposable household incomes. So, so now we are at, at the household level. And um, this is uh, just the uh, incidence rate for households of uh, different minimum wage levels in our sample. So as you can see, a minimum wage of 5 euro per hour would only affect about 3.5% of the households in Germany. And it would be uh, significantly different uh, more than 15% uh, when the minimum wage is set at 8 euro 50. And again, this increases uh, to almost 25% with a minimum wage of uh, uh, 10 euro per hour. Uh, these are just uh, to put the relative changes, uh, uh, or to have a, a measure for the uh, relative change. This is just the uh, income levels uh, in, this, uh, in the status quo. OK. so. Let's now look at the changes in income. First, the first two lines refer to, to the scenario only with nominal changes. So the first two lines assume no behavioral effects. And you can see that, um, and this is only, this uh, table is only for the households that are affected by the minimum wage. Right? This is not in overall, it's not the average over all households, but only for those who are affected. So you could see that uh, a minimum wage of five euro per hour would basically do nothing to incomes, even for those who are affected uh, uh, with an increase of uh, uh, about uh, 80 uh, euros per year. It would change, uh, that would change if you look at uh, 8 euro 50. So without any behavioral adjustments, we estimate an uh, average increase for those households that are affected of about 900 euros per year, uh, or about well, almost 3% of total income per year. Uh, and there's no, so remember the nominal uh, effects in, on wages in, uh, for, for the realized or disposable incomes, um, setting the minimum wage higher does not translate linearly in, in, in the higher amount of income because of uh, the interaction with the uh, tax and uh, benefit system. So you see a change from 850 to 10 euro just translate in an increase from uh, 3 to uh, slightly more than 4%. So the, uh, uh, the other columns refer to these different scenarios uh, with uh, um, uh, uh, behavioral adjustments. After the uh, adjustment of employment, you can see that uh, the uh, 
so for the low wage, uh, low minimum wage level, the, the, the very small uh, positive effect vanishes completely. For the uh, other scenarios, um, for the 850 scenario, it is reduced roughly by half, just uh, taking employment effects, and this is the scenario with the medium range um, demand elasticity. So if you would say that aggregate demand is inelastic, this number would be closer to the, uh, the uh, scenario without uh, employment adjustment. And it's, uh, it's uh, even worse uh, if you set the minimum wage higher because the relative income change is smaller, but the effect on employment, as you, as you saw, is, uh, is much higher. So, uh, it really, uh, so the, the discrepancy between the no behavior adjustment uh, scenario and uh, uh, with employment effects is, uh, is even uh, uh, larger for a high minimum wage level. If you also take into account uh, price changes, so this is um, how, um, how production prices adjust after the introduction of a minimum wage, the effects become negative. Again, these are rather extreme assumptions of full shifting, right? So, and several margins are not in the model, but just to give you, give you uh, an idea, after uh, price effects, and even if you take more moderate assumptions, uh, this again eats away from, uh, from potential benefits of, uh, of a minimum wage. If they necessarily have to become negative, I, I, I wouldn't bet on it, and it's, it's, not, it's not that important. It's important uh, a little bit to get uh, a feel for uh, uh, what in relative terms uh, this, this would do. This is, these are just the numbers per household, and this is the aggregate numbers. I think I, I would not talk in detail about uh, the aggregate figures here. So now these were just the average effects. Now let's have a look at the distribution. So this is, uh, these uh, uh, are uh, is a table for um, disposable household incomes equivalized by the size of the household. Five minutes? Perfect. Um, so uh, we not only take into account disposable incomes, but also the composition and size of the households. And um, as you can see, first, maybe um, the uh, share of uh, uh, um, affected households in these different uh, deciles of the, of the equivalent, equivalent uh, distribution. The, the, well, uh, we have seen this pattern before. The highest uh, numbers you can find in the second to um, even fifth decile. Um, and you still find a significant amount of uh, low wage earners up to the 10th, tenth decile. So s th since this was discussed several times, I think don't have to get more into detail about this. And not only in terms of the share of affected uh, uh, households, but also in terms of the um, relative uh, size of the uh, income gain, you can see that uh, it also is highest in the second decile, and it's still, uh, I mean, it's still significantly different from zero uh, very, very uh, yeah, until the top of the income distribution, basically. So these are the, the this is uh, the uh, change in income per decile, and you see in relative terms, it's highest in, in, in the lower decile, but this is, kind of the only uh, indicator that is highest for this decile, but, but thinking of a larger share and a larger amount, um, so, uh, so it's still uh, significant in, in higher decides of the uh, income distribution. And now, uh, again, this shows these three different uh, scenarios, no behavior adjustments with uh, employment effects, and, and you can see that um, uh, the, yeah, but basically, this, this uh, reproduces the, the, the findings from before and shows the distribution uh, over, over the different uh, uh, decides. So with employment effects, it's again reduced by half, but uh, very unevenly uh, distributed. So here you see that um, uh, the uh, uh, lower decides relatively uh, gain more after employment effects are taken into account. And uh, in absolute terms, in relative, and also in relative terms, uh, this changes when uh, consumption is taken into account or the price change is taken into account, then the, then the um, picture changes again a little bit. So how does this translate in some kind of aggregate, um, uh, aggregate number on uh, income inequality? 
So maybe we just focus on the first line here. These are again uh, different, these different scenarios, and you can see using again the Gini coefficient for the equ equivalent uh, income distribution, we see that uh, a minimum wage of eight euro fifty would not uh, significantly change uh, the uh, income distribution in any of those scenarios. It it reduces uh, inequality slightly in uh, in the in the in the um, scenario without behavior adjustments. As soon as you as you um, take those behavior adjustments into account, it basically vanishes to zero. And um, last comparison, maybe so. This is the middle uh, scenario with 850, and it's not very different uh, for these other scenarios. So this is um, 8 euro 50, and this is 10 euro. And we even for 10 euros, we do not find a significant effect on the overall income distribution. In, in none of our scenarios, it's largest if no one reacts, uh, neither on the labor market nor in terms of product prices. If you take those channels into account, again, the effect goes towards zero. Okay, so let me quickly con conclude what we, what we showed. Uh, we had a substantial impact on the wage distribution, unless the minimum wage is set very low at, say, uh, five euros, and we saw a huge degree of heterogeneity uh, for different groups. It has a very limited effect on the disposable household income. This is true on, uh, for the average uh, uh, household and also uh, in terms of changes in the distribution. Even with no behavioral adjustments, so with no negative employment effects, we do not find an, a statistically uh, significant effect on the income distribution. Regarding the mechanisms, uh, I al already hinted at those. So we have first a substitution of means-tested transfers for these uh, minimum wage earners because of the household context. And um, also we have high marginal tax rates because of progressive income taxation and joint filing. And the well-known here, well-known uh, mechanism of the distribution of low-wage earners over over the household. So the minimum wage is certainly not well targeted, uh, and um, well, we can we can. I, I don't mind to to to, to coin it. It's no efficient redistributive tool. I, for Germany, I would even go as far as saying that um, it's no effective redistributive redistributive tool. Okay, that's all I have. Thanks.